okay, in this lesson, we're going to cover vertical effective stress. Now, I know that not all of you want to be geotechnical engineers, right? This is a required class for all civil and environmental engineering students and for geophysics majors in the Earth Planetary and Space Science um, department. Um, if you don't plan on becoming a geotechnical engineer, that's perfectly fine with me but you should remember vertical effective stress. This is the most important part of the entire class. So if there's one thing you take away from this, it should be this lesson right here. Um, vertical effective stress is the parameter that really controls soil strength and stiffness and the mechanical behavior of soil. And it's, um, it's important to, to give some thought into how we think about effective stress. So here's a, uh, a diagram showing four soil particles that are all in contact with each other. They make um, you know, contact basically at points. Um, they're not really points, actually. There's a little bit of contact area, and there's big forces transmitted across those inner particle contacts, and those forces act at different directions and so forth. Um, so if we zoom in on the soil and we calculate the pressure, let's say, at that inner particle contact, it's going to be really big, right? Because there's some force acting over a tiny area. And then if we move just a little bit away in that void space, the stress is zero, right? If it's in air, maybe there's no pressure there. So the first thing that I want to mention is that um, soil is not a continuum, all right? We're going to analyze effective stress as if soil is a continuum, and the continuum assumption can be really useful a lot of the time. But soil is not a continuum. Stress, stresses are actually really high at inner particle contacts, really low away from inner particle contacts. Um, so we should always remember that it, it is a particulate material, but we're setting that aside for now because the task of figuring out all of these inner particle forces between every single soil particle, say below an entire building, that would be ridiculous, right, to try and solve that whole problem. So um, we're going to use continuum concepts instead. That means that you know the Cauchy stress tensor is a continuum um, concept. So we're going to use stress tensors. So the effective stress is a continuum concept, and it's defined as kind of the average of all of these inner particle forces acting over some area and in some direction. In this case, we're doing vertical effective stress, so it would be the vertical projection of each of these inner particle forces. And we average them over some area and divide by that area. Right, and that's the vertical effective stress. So it's a measure of how much of the, the force pushing on the soil is carried between soil particles at their contacts, and then maybe there's some water pressure inside the middle too that would carry some of the pressure as well. Now, even though soil is not a continuum, it's a particulate material, it's okay for us to analyze it as a continuum as long as the size of the domain that we're worried about is really big relative to the size of the individual soil particles. So when we put a big building, say Balter Hall, rests on top of the soil, the size of those soil particles is so small compared to the size of Balter Hall that it's okay for us to ignore the fact that it's a bunch of particles and we can get away with analyzing it as a continuum. Uh, on the other hand, if you had big cobbles that were all, you know, in contact with each other, say, to prevent erosion of a slope at a, at a port facility or something like that, um, you know, those big cobbles are, are going to be pretty large relative to maybe a boat that would collide with them or some other loading condition. That's really not a continuum anymore, right? The particles are so big. So anyway, we will stick with the continuum concept assuming the particles are small relative to the size of the domain. I'll also point out that there's actually no such thing as a continuum. <laughs> this is always a concept that's a compromise. We're um, assuming that the size of the internal scale of the material is small relative to the size of the domain. In fact, steel is not a continuum either. All right, If you were to zoom way in on steel, eventually you would get to the point of seeing little crystals and atoms and you know then it becomes not a continuum anymore usually that scale is so small that we're not worried about it unless we're materials scientists or something like that so we'll treat it as a continuum all right now let's motivate the uh, discussion of effective stress by considering a uh, a weight suspended on a spring so here's a weight here's a spring and then here's a scale 
This might be like when you're weighing produce at the grocery store. I don't know if people still do this, but there used to be a scale. You could put your apples in there, figure out how much they weighed, and then you would know how much that should cost when you check out. All right, if it's suspended in air, the weight is hanging there, and the amount that you're going to measure on the scale is equal to that weight, right? That, that's a pretty basic idea, but it's important to establish that first. Um, and then the weight has a volume, V sub S. So I'm using S to mean solid here, because that's what we'll use when we get to soil. Now, if we took this assembly of the scale and the weight and the spring, and then uh, suspended the weight in water, so here's the weight, there's the water surface, um, I would argue now that the force acting on the spring, which is measured by the scale, is going to be lower than W sub S. And um, there's a really simple, intuitive way for you to think about this. Okay, when, when my kids were little and I would take them swimming, they would love walking around holding me in the water, right? They were maybe five or six years old. Obviously, they can't hold me in air. Their bodies are too small and too heavy for them. We'd jump in the pool and they could just carry me around. And they loved it. They thought that they were like so strong. Well, the reason is that the, the weight that I was pushing down against them with was less because the water was partially supporting me. So when we suspend this weight in water, there's an, a buoyancy effect that happens that makes the net force acting on the spring lower. And we can analyze that force, right, that buoyancy effect. So here's a diagram showing water pressure versus depth below the water table, D sub W. And um, it's a linear line. The slope of it is gamma sub W, right? The slope of the, um, this line would be the unit weight of water. Um, OK, so the pressure acting at point 1 is uh, gamma W times DW1. The pressure acting at point 2 is just gamma W times DW2. Really simple calculation, hydrostatic water table. Now let's make a free body diagram of this mass. Okay, we have the weight that's acting downward, and then we have some pressures. There's U1 acting over the top surface, and there's U2 acting on the bottom surface, and then acting on these horizontal surfaces, you have these inclined pressures that start at U1 and become equal to U2 at the bottom of the mass. Um, so again, we have U1 is gamma W times DW1, U2 is gamma W times DW2. Now this isn't really a free body diagram because we need to have forces and we have a mix here. This is a force and these are pressures. So we need to integrate these pressures over the area on which they act to come up with the net forces. So um, first the side stresses are equal and opposite to each other so they cancel out. We're only dealing with vertical pressures here anyway so I'm just going to ignore the side pressures now since they're equal and opposite. And then I'm going to assume that the cross-sectional area of the top and bottom is equal to A. So if you had a three-dimensional diagram, right, that area there is A. Um, so what we do now is that the vertical force is U1 times A acting on the top, and the vertical force is U2 times A acting on the bottom. And now we can take a resultant force, and U2 is bigger than U1, so what I'm going to do is have WS and then a resultant force acting on the bottom of the block which is U2 minus U1 times A. Uh, and then if we substitute in U1 and U2, we get gamma W times DW2 minus DW1, right? So that's U2 minus U1 right there. Then what we notice is that this term right here, the DW2 minus DW1 times A is equal to the volume of the block, right? DW2 minus DW1 is the height of the block. And then A is the cross-sectional area in the horizontal and horizontal plane. So we can simplify this, that the net force acting upward on the bottom of the block is equal to gamma W times Vs, where uh, Vs is the volume of the solid material and gamma W is the unit weight of water. So what we've done here is derived Archimedes' principle. And that states that the upward force exerted on a submerged object by the water is equal to the volume of displaced water multiplied by the unit weight of water. Okay, now um, this is a generalized extension of the problem that I've done. Okay, I've kind of derived this assuming a nice uniform square shape here or a cubic shape if you do it in three dimensions. Uh, it turns out that the shape doesn't really matter 
um, you can have an irregular shape, like a soil particle or whatever shape you want. The upward force acting on that shape, on that object, um, when you submerge it in water, is going to be equal to that, the volume of that shape times the unit weight of water. But however much water you're displacing is going to be pushing up on the object. So let's go back now. What is the force acting on that spring? So here's zero. Here's Ws. That was the force acting on the spring in the air. In this case, we have a reduced force, Ws minus gamma W times Vs. Um, and, and let's extend this a little further. Let's say that the unit weight of this mass just happens to be exactly equal to the unit weight of water. Okay, it's a material that's neutrally buoyant. Well, if you were to lower it into the water, this spring would have no force, right? It's fully supported by the water. It's just kind of floating around, like if this was a, a block of ice or something like that. Ice is actually slightly less dense than liquid water because it expands a little bit during freezing. But, you know, if we treat them as being equal, then there would be no force on there. I, on the other hand, if the, if the weight has less density than water, you're, you're going to have to push it down, right? So there would be a negative force over here to hold that thing under the water. Like if it was a big box full of air or something like that, you'd have to push down on it to hold it down. And then of course, if it's denser than water, which soil particles are, it is gonna pull down on the spring just by a reduced amount. So um, let's do another sort of simple um, concept here to motivate our discussion of effective stress for soil. And this is gonna relate um, the uh, the, the pressure acting on the bottom of the block to the stress, the horizontal stress that's required to slide the block along a plane. So let's say that we have a rigid base here that's permeable, right? So that what it means by permeable is that if we end up submerging the um, block, let's say we have a water table up here and the block is submerged, that water is free to migrate through the permeable, ba permeable base and act upward on the bottom of the block. So all of these little um, dots right there. I'm going to use that notation to indicate a permeable layer. And we'll come back to this notation when we get into talking about consolidation and drainage boundaries. All right, now, uh, in, so here's some notation. The weight of the block is Ws. Um, N is the effective normal force. So that's the force that's acting between the, perme the, the rigid base material and the uh, weight of the solid block. And then T is the force required to slide the block along. So, um, all right, so first we start with this in air. Um, the full weight of the uh, block is acting on the solid part of the rigid base. Therefore, the normal force N is just equal to the weight of the block, all right, because it's air. Just like when we had the hanging weight in air, right? Well, the, the spring constant here for the hanger is now going to be. Um, analogous to the force here acting at this interface. So instead of suspending the block, we're supporting it from the bottom. So the, the horizontal force required to start sliding this block, if, if it has a coefficient of static friction mu, the horizontal force is equal to mu times n, which of course is just equal to mu times ws, the coefficient of friction times the weight of the block. On the other hand, if we submerge the block, Let's say that you know, we now have the water up above the block and there's water pressure pushing upward on the bottom of the block and on top of the block too. Now there's a buoyancy effect that we have to consider. So the normal force is reduced, right? It's Ws minus gamma W times Vs. Therefore, the horizontal force required to slide the block is reduced too, right? The, the strength of that sliding interface is lower. T is equal to mu times Ws minus gamma W times Vs. So we've made the capacity less just by submerging it underwater. We haven't changed the, um, the, the properties of the solid material, right? Mu is still the coefficient of friction, but we've made it weaker. And again, you can imagine if the block is exactly the same weight as water, same density, when you submerge it, it's basically neutrally buoyant and it would be really easy to slide it back and forth. It wouldn't require any force to do that. So the sliding block has less capacity when it's submerged. Now, uh, the reason why this analogy is relevant to soil is that soil is a frictional material. Okay? The strength and stiffness of soil depends on how strong are those interparticle contacts, 
how much force is required to make those soil particles slide past each other. When a soil fails, it's usually not because the particles themselves break, it's just because they slide past each other and you fail the interface, the frictional interface between the particles. So soil is a frictional material whose strength and stiffness arises from inner particle forces and any kind of water pressure that's inside the soil that reduces those inner particle forces will therefore reduce the strength and stiffness of the soil. And so we now can introduce the definition of effective stress. And uh, this equation is one that I will put on probably your midterm and your final, and I expect you to have it memorized. So you shouldn't have to look through your notes to find it. Fortunately, it's a really easy equation. So sigma prime is the effective stress, right? We're going to add a prime now, and we'll have vertical effective stress, horizontal effective stress. You can do effective stress in any direction. Then uh, we'll have total stress, which was just sigma minus water pressure, pore pressure. So sigma prime is equal to sigma minus u. Um, so it's, it's a really simple equation, simple concept. Um, and it turns out that the effective stress is really what controls the strength and stiffness of soil. So it's a, an important quantity for us to derive. And then uh, later on, we'll figure out how to calculate the strength of soil using effective stress principles.